we greet you in the worthy name of Jesus. It is a name that is given among men whereby we can be saved. I appreciate the challenges laid before us this morning already, and we, um, we recognize that in this life we have many challenges, and we have many of these challenges in Montezuma as well. And I come to realize that whether in Lancaster, Pennsylvania or in Montezuma, Georgia, the, the devil doesn't, doesn't care. As long as, as long as he can work his work, he is satisfied. But Jesus Christ came and God himself provided a way that we, through him, through Jesus Christ, can overcome those powers that Satan throws at us. And I, I appreciate Brother Lancho's devotion this morning. Um, and that devotional, I'm just going to read the heading of that scripture. Safety of the godly who put their trust in God's protection. The, uh, the talk that Brother Joe gave up here a while ago was quite a challenge to me as we continue to face life, face our modern day advances, technology, and the things that we face in, in our Christian world, in, in our Christian world today as, as a separated people unto God, it seems like the, the, the world is trying to find a way to integrate again the church into its system. And it's, it's uh, but as, as we come to realize, you know, our confidence should be in God alone, not in the works of man. Because man, when man tries to, to uh, man, man tries to make a, or create a utopia for himself, and you know what's happening, he's creating a larger mess. And, and things are becoming chaotic because man and because of what man is doing. But one thing that we have to realize, even in all this, that God knows what he is doing. And when we, when we read the book of Revelation... And I love the book of Revelation because it talks about the prophetical scripture. I love the book of Daniel. He also talks about, the pro he, he prophesies about things to come. And it's quite challenging to me as I read the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and I try to make comparisons and we see things progressing and, and, and it seems like the, the, the longer we progress, the faster things are coming to pass. And so as we continue to face life and its circumstances, we have to realize that God is still in control. That even though, even though it would cost my life for my profession of a separated life unto God and a, and a commitment to live for God, that even if it would cost my life, the cost would be worth it because the alternative is unthinkable. God created us in his image. And I preached a message at home. I'm not sure, was it, I think it was about, about a month and a half ago. In the image of God. God created us, in, created us in his image. He created us for his honor and for his glory. But man is taking another road. They're, they're taking another road and, and, and it's, it's sad and yet we have to come to realize God is great, God is holy, God is just, and God is true. In the greatness of God, 
God told Moses in the mountain, when Moses said, you know, when God was trying to send Moses unto the Israelites, he said like this. Moses said, well, you know, um, what shall I tell the children of Israel when, when I go to them and say, who sent me? God said, tell them that the I am sent me. And so God himself needs no definition other than the I am. He is the great. He is the wonderful. He is mighty, omnipotent, omnipresent. And, and so who else should we look to? I have, I have here something that I copied off in the doctrines of the Bible, in the doctrine of God, and it says like this. The infinite being, whom we call God, can be described only in the language of infinity. His dominions are immeasurable. His wisdom, unfathomable, unfathomable. His greatness beyond comparison. His riches unsearchable. His ways past finding out. We have reached the limit of our knowledge when we exclaim with the psalmist, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Taken out of Psalm chapter 90, verse 2. And yet, it is through him only that the light of revelation is thrown upon the canvas of time and the realms of the past, present and future, are brought within the grasp of finite man. The heathen who knows not God is shrouded in ignorance, mysticism, and superstition. The agnostic who refuses to know God, though he often prides himself on his intelligence and knowledge, knows absolutely nothing beyond the reach of the finite mind. It is alone the child of God through whose faith access is found to the hidden mysteries which mortal man unaided can never, never fathom. That can speak intelligently of the living God, his wonderful works. On every hand, there are evidences of supreme being. Conditions which can be accounted for only on the ground that there is a living, all-wise, all-powerful, supernatural, superhuman, infinite being who is without beginning or ending, a loving and living creator who is without the limitations of all or any of his creatures. The very existence of matter is a miracle which necessitates the existence of a miracle worker. The origin of matter of life, of intelligence, and the relation between mind and matter are but the beginning of things that the human mind can never hope to fathom, except through the revelations from him who created all things and in whom all, all power is vested. This being we call God. In reverence we bow before him and bless his holy name. And so God himself is an infinite being. He is a God of all wisdom. And as we worship him this morning, we worship him with this one verse that was read in Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, let us exalt his name together. Reverence fills the soul of the worshiper as he finds himself in the presence of the infinite being, whom we call God, high and holy, mighty and glorious, matchless and marvelous in all his wondrous works, perfect in wisdom and love, infinite in power, and great beyond the comprehension of all his creatures far beyond the grasp of any human being, 
and yet so simple and near that the humblest human being may have him as a daily companion and intimate friend. His being fills us with a, with a feeling of adoration and praise, and we acknowledge that it is but proper and right for him to say, be still and know that I am God. As an introduction to the message here this morning, we, came, we come to realize that God is wonderful. And the message this morning, I would like to speak, the, speak on the eyes of God Almighty. Does God have eyes? Can God see? Sure he can. You know, you have to, you have to but go to the book of, Revel, of, uh, of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, it says, and God saw. And God saw. And God saw. And it says it. Let me see. Fifteen. The eyes of the Lord. Says it many times. In Genesis. God saw, and then in, in the, in the, uh, at the end of his creation, and God saw that it was very good. And so the Lord sees. It's one of the... How should I say? Now, let's go, let's go to Proverbs chapter 15. I have just a few scriptures that I would like to read in relation to the eyes of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3. Here we have moral virtues and their contrary vices. And there's a number of chapters here in Proverbs that talks about their moral verses, about the moral virtues and their contrary vices. Verse 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding. Now, what is he beholding? What does it say? Just the good? You know, the Lord loves when we do good, does he not? But it says here that the Lord beholds the evil and the good. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them, them whose heart is perfect toward him. His eyes run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And, you know, it gives us a picture of God. He is going about in the earth. And, and for those that love righteousness, those that work holiness, God is there for us. He is there purposely for us with his omnipotence, with his presence, with his power. God is there to help us. Let's think about the eyes. Sometimes in the scripture, the eyes are used in a different sense. You know, sometimes it's used in its actual sense, and other times it's used symbolically. The eyes of a person, of a person are very important, are they not? You know, without eyes, we couldn't see. We just couldn't see. You know, and we all may well know some people that, that do not have eyes or cannot see. They have eyes but can't see. Eyes are made to see with. But somehow God has seen fit that some people cannot see. And they walk around with a stick in their hands. They cannot see. 
The eyes are very important to us. I had a great uncle that had one eye. I don't know how many of you knew Saul Yoder from Montezuma, Georgia. He had one eye. He had one glass eye and the other good eye. The eye of a person, and by the way, this Saul would have been Mary Ellen's grandfather. I'm not sure where Mary Ellen is in this big crowd here. The eyes of a person is very important to our well-being. We make decisions based on the things we see. We make adjustments. We make judgments. We read. And we're learning by the things that we see. With our eyes, we get a wealth of information. We are constantly looking, watching, reading, whatever else our eyes do for us. Our eyes seem to be a window to our soul. Our facial expression in our eyes say a lot about us. A clean and a pure person can look you in the face and can smile with a peaceful expression. A deceiver can look you in the eye, but his, his expression is a gotcha expression. But a sinner can hardly look you in the eye with a pure conscience. Because deep in his heart, he knows there's guilt. So with the eyes, we take in a lot and we give a lot away. Now, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 6, says the light of the body is the eye. Meaning our interests, desires, our ambitions, our direction in which the attention is attracted. It depends on that focus as to how we will meet the eyes of God. This, the, the important thing about it is, is that we all come to realize that we will never get away from the eyes of God. The psalmist says, and I'm not sure I can quote that, but he says, though I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Meaning, God sees us. And, and, he, and he gives different descriptions there. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not able to quote that at this time. And I, I'm not going to turn to it for the sake of time. But the eyes of God follow us wherever we go. Wherever we go. To the saved, it is a blessing. The eyes of God are a blessing. To the sinner, the eyes of God and his gaze, he will not meet. We all know how it is to have sin in our life and to have to repent of it. When with sin in our lives, we do not want to meet God. Why? Can you imagine? And I know you can because you've, you've probably went through the same thing I have already. You're at home as a young child and your father tells you, now do not do such and such a thing or you do this and you do exactly what your father tells you not to do or you don't do what your father tells you to do, and you walk up to your father, and your eyes cannot meet father. Father's eyes. 
Why? Because God placed within our, within, our, within our hearts, within our bosom, within our being, a conscience. And that conscience has been defiled by our disobedience. And same way in the kingdom of God, we defile our conscience by our disobedience. And we cannot meet the eyes of God because of the defilement within our bosom. And so God wants his people to be clean, to be holy, to be just, to be true, to be honest, and to live such lives that would be a glory to his name, because otherwise we, can, we cannot be a glory to his name. And we cannot meet the eyes of God with defilement. The sinner will try to disguise himself. Now, we all know that there are people out there that will, you see them one day, and the next day you may see the same person, but you don't know it. You know, we could, we could uh, if we had the right clothes up here, I could disguise myself that you wouldn't even, you would hardly recognize who I am. I could put some kind of a funky looking hat on. I could change my suit for some other kind of coat and do a little tweaking here and there and you probably wouldn't know it. Maybe put some dark sunglasses on. There are people that disguise themselves. But the point I would like to make is that within all this, di this disguise that we try to do of disguising ourselves there is still the heart has not changed the heart has not changed and so God looks beyond the facade and he looks right into the heart and God sees and God knows God is not fooled God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Psalm chapter 19, it says like this, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Oh, how I love to read thy law. Oh, how I love the word of God. The psalmist brings out time and again about loving the Word of God. What does the Word of God do to us? It enlightens us, does it not? And we love to be enlightened as God's people, as a, pure, as a people that is, that is, that, that is trying to be pure, trying to be holy, trying to be a separated from the world, if you please, trying to keep ourselves from the world so that we are not caught up in all the, the, the things that would cloud our eyes, our vision. So that we can meet God face to face and look God in the eyes with a pure conscience and a pure heart. But if I read my Bible right, it says that in the end, there are few that are going to be, be saved. There are few that are going to be able to look God in the eyes with that purity of heart. And I would to God that each one of us would be one of the few that could meet God face to face and look God in the eye with a pure conscience and a pure heart. And not like and, and I, when, I, when I say this, I am especially thinking of one incident in my life. And I won't tell you what the incident was. But I walked up to my father. I was, I don't know, don't remember exactly how the situation was, but it was down in Costa Rica. 
I could not look my father in the eye because I knew. I knew. That my heart was not right. You know, the eyes of our father is one thing. Earthly father. But the eyes of almighty God... I'm trying to recall where that verse is. Um, trying to recall the verse. Um, but anyways, discerning between the, the uh, somehow or other that, that the discernment between the joints and morals and is the, the discernment of the thoughts and intents, I got that all kind of mixed up. Where is that found? Pardon? Hebrews. Yes. I have a new Bible here, and I don't have that one marked. Where was Hebrews 12, what? 4.12, 4, 12. yes. Appreciate that. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is quick, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest... In his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. With man we can disguise ourselves, but with God there is no disguise. The eyes of the Lord. And can you imagine... Standing before the throne of God, and every knee will stand before him and confess that he is Lord, will bow, bow before him and confess that he is Lord. And can you imagine bending before God in his piercing eyes into our soul? There's nothing hid from God. There is nothing hid from God. But his eyes looking at us. Let's go ahead and read through verse 16. I have actually have it written down here. For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again. Excuse me, I'm in the, another chapter here. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain, obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Everything is naked and open to the eyes of God, Lord God Almighty. Now let's go to the book of Psalm in closing. Psalm chapter 33 and 34. Here again, it talks about the eyes of the Lord. 33 verses 17 through 22. A horse is a vain thing for safety. Neither shall he deliver any by his great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help 
our shield. For our heart shall rejoice in him because we have trusted in his holy name. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us according as we hope in thee. And now verse chapter 34, in verse 16, in closing, here it says, in verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his heart and his ears are open unto their cry for the face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. But if our heart is right with God and we can meet God face to face, then we revert to the first part of this chapter. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Isn't that wonderful? When we can have such a testimony that comes forth, not only from our lips, but our life is radiating that kind of a testimony. Let's kneel for prayer at this time. Our holy God and Father, as we come before your holy presence, we recognize that you are on the throne ruling and overruling. And dear Heavenly Father, that we are created for your honor and glory. We are created in your image. Help us, Lord, that we may not disappoint you nor your kingdom but that we might be willing vessels in the hand in your hand that we may go forth day by day serving you faithful until you come again dear heavenly father the uncertainties of life lord you know so we commit all things into your hands we do not have to fear the future for we know that you hold the future dear heavenly father we pray that you might just bless this congregation its leaders. Bless each member, Lord, that we may all continue as we continue to strive for the sake of your kingdom, that we may be vessels that would be a testimony and a witness, that we would be willing and able someday to meet you face to face and confess your lordship over our life with a pure heart. So we ask again that you might just bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.